So last week, I summarized um, from chapter 13 all the way up to chapter 16, verse 4. So for the extensive summary, just go to last week's sermon. But to summarize a little bit after that, to remind you from last week, Jesus, again, because he says it multiple times in this discourse that goes from chapter 13 to chapter, through chapter 16, and then he prays in 17, is that he's going to be going to the Father. And he notices that the disciples are grieving and none of them are asking him where he's going because they're more concerned about the fact that he is going somewhere. And so he does tell them that it's to their advantage that he's leaving. He promises the helper, this is between 5 and 22, and he says that the Holy Spirit, who's the helper, won't come to them until Jesus goes to the Father. And so he encourages them that the Holy Spirit will allow them to know more about God and more about the redemptive plan. Remember, they were writing the New Testament and teaching new believers. And after that, he tells them this cryptic saying, a little while and you no longer are going to see me. And again, a little while you will see me. That's in verse 16. And they don't know what he's talking about. So, so he basically tells them that they're going to grieve and they're going to mourn, but their grief will be turned to joy because they will see him again. And part of it is they will see him raised from the dead in just about three days. But then the other piece, and it makes a lot of sense when we look at verse 23, is that he's also talking about when they receive the Holy Spirit and having the presence of Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit. As I said before, we have the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within us, within the person of the Holy Spirit. And so, Jesus, in verse 22, says, Therefore, you too have grief now, just like the woman, the pregnant woman who hasn't delivered yet. But then, her grief will be turned to joy when she delivers the child. But then it says, But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one is going to take your joy away from you. And so, here we begin in verse 23, and we'll read it all the way through first. And on that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figures of speech. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name, and I am not saying to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father." I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, See, now you are speaking plainly and are not using any figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and that you have no need for anyone to question you. That is why we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus replied to them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, 
each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. All right, so you see verse 23, on that day. And again, it's talking about when they will see him and ultimately when they receive the Holy Spirit. So if you will, Pentecost. Because why? why? Because it says you will not question me about anything. In Acts 1, before they receive the Holy Spirit, if you remember from last week, they ask him, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore your king, the kingdom to Israel? First of all, they didn't understand Jesus' mission. That first of all is going to go beyond Israel. And second of all, they were still thinking in a physical kingdom. And that's all fine and good, but because in the millennium, that's the way it will be. But they were getting ahead of themselves. But then in Acts 2, Peter talks about when he addresses the crowd, he says, this Jesus whom you crucified is now both God has made him Lord and Christ. And so, and he tells, and when they ask him, well, what can we do then? He says, believe, repent, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then 3,000 came to salvation that day. What a difference it makes for the Holy Spirit to have been in them and for the Holy Spirit to be in us now. So, so he says, truly, truly, or amen, amen, is the way the Greek would say. So when we say amen, this is like, yes, this is absolutely true. I'm agreeing. And it's not like Jesus needs to say that because other times what he says isn't true. Everything he says is true, but he wants them to get it even more. If you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Notice it says anything. And it also says in my name. He will give it to you. So let's look at a couple of passages to be able to further understand it. Because if we just take it, if we just look at it, we could be like, we could either focus on the anything or we could focus on the in my name. And we need to focus on both. So in James 1, 5 to 8, it says this. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So yes, when people say you need to have faith in what you're praying and that it will happen, that's very important. And notice the example not the example because this is in context, but it talks about asking for wisdom. So we know that we, we know that if any of you lacks wisdom, he could ask of God because that's, we know that's totally in his will to ask for wisdom. And notice, to ask in faith without doubting. So, and trust me, this is, I'm preaching to myself right now. It's so important to pray with expectation. 
And yet we must also look at James verses 2 and 3 where it says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder and you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. So, notice too, we have to also ask God to check our hearts when we pray. So, and then, notice it says, in my name. So it's according to his will. So the other thing is that we can rest assured that when we're his children, right? Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation and Jesus Christ alone, that we have his will working it out for our good. So we ask in expectation. We know that we need to check our hearts as well. And we know that, that the will of God is always for our good. So even if he doesn't answer the way that we ask, we can know that he is answering the way he needs to answer and for our good and for the good of all those who love him. But when we know that it's something good to pray for, like the salvation of someone, the healing of someone, we ought to pray in expectation unless at some point we realize that, no, this is, God is, well, certainly for, not for salvation, but for healing, that God is, not going to heal that person, but he's going to use it, right? But until then, we pray in expectation. And most of the time, we would pray and pray and pray until that person would pass. And then we would know that, that it was God's will, right? So we need to understand, I need to understand, it's so important to know that when we pray, you know, prayer is powerful because God is powerful and because we are his children. And when we ask in the name of Jesus, he will answer us according to his will. Now, Notice in verse 24, for them, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. And why is that? Well, because at this point, Jesus hasn't been nailed to the cross and hasn't risen from the dead. So at this point, they wouldn't have any way. And another thing is he was right there. So he would, they would talk to him. But it says, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Understand that God wants to answer our prayers. And yes, he can answer yes, no, or wait. But he also, he often wants to answer our prayers yes, especially when our hearts are devoted to him and are looking to, to his will. So, notice, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Notice in verse 22, it says that no one is going to take your joy away from you. So, in other words, he's already promising them joy. But now he's saying that your joy may be made full. And that's the way it is for us. That when we come to Christ, we have a joy. We have the joy of our salvation. But you know, and we receive the Holy Spirit. 
at that point. But it, the Bible also talks about, Ephesians 5 talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's talking about being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So then it would be having more and more of him fleshed out in our lives. So the joy would be made full. Look, isn't it great to see the Lord answering our prayers? To know that we have a loving father who's deeply concerned about everything that we do and everything that we need. And Jesus is encouraging the disciples to ask in his name. So notice verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figures of speech. Now, figures of speech, you know, if you notice, I, I use the, the term a cryptic message because really it was a veiled truth, if you will. That's the basically what, from my reading, is the understanding of what the Greek is talking about, is that it was a veiled truth. So I read you that example of a little while and you are going to see me. You're no longer going to see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Like what? Huh? Uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> Is what the disciples were saying. He obviously wasn't being completely forthcoming, but he wasn't saying something untrue. He was just not fully explaining it. And so that's what he's talking about when he's talking about figures of speech. Then he says, an hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And ultimately that will happen after they receive the Holy Spirit. Although he will talk to them quite a bit during those 40 days after he rises from the dead. Now notice it says, on that day, you will ask in my name. So again, receiving the Holy Spirit. And then we get to ask in Jesus' name because of what he did on the cross. And so when we pray, we can pray, dear Jesus, or dear Holy Spirit, we can pray that way. It's not wrong per se, but if you will, the model is praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's starting to set up here. But also notice right? That Jesus is saying to pray in his name. And why? Why do we pray in his name? Because he is our high priest. And they understood that because the high priest had to pr intercede for them. And this is a truth from Hebrews 4, 4, 14 to 16 that we should always hold on to. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who, have pa who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. So yes, we can also go in confidently. And just think of this for a moment. God invites us to enter the throne of grace with confidence. It says so right in Hebrews 4, we just read it. In Revelation 3, Jesus talks about him, about 
him standing at the door and knocking. And then, you know, to, to whomever opens the door, I will eat with him and he with me. But notice, like what? Jesus will knock on the door of our hearts, but he will, but he says, come right in. Now the Father says, come right in because of Jesus. And also in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it talks about, you know, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. So that's also why we pray in Jesus' name, because he is our intermedi intermediary. Unfortunately, some people don't understand that. For example, Catholics think that Mary is the, is the go-between, is the go-between us and Jesus. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is our high priest. And through the blood of Jesus, we can go straight to the Father. And we know that because in verse 26, when he says, on that day, you will ask in my name. And I'm not saying that I will request of the Father on your behalf. So he is our mediator, but he's not. He is praying for us, but when we pray, we have access to the Father. He's praying for us in ways that we don't even understand, just like the Holy Spirit is in Romans 8. But we have direct access to the Father, and that's why we say Heavenly Father or our Father, because we can and we know that he hears us. Why? Because it says, for the Father himself loves you. He's talking to the disciples, but we can definitely take this truth for our own. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So what's it mean? Because you have loved me. Does that mean that the Father didn't love us first? What's it saying? Well, first of all, it's saying that because they came to faith in Jesus, now they can come to the Father. Now we are in the Father's love. However, the Father absolutely loved us even before that. Because what does it say? It says in verse 6, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good person someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's Romans 5, 6 to 8. So coming back to John. So you can see that the father was the initiator. But now that when we put our faith in Jesus, then we are in the Father's love. And now we can come to him in prayer. And we can come every day. So, and notice, they believe that he came forth from the Father. And that's important because we have to believe that Jesus is God. In fact, in verse 28, it's a quick synopsis of his mission. It says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So you notice a couple of things. First of all, 
Jesus was not created. In fact, in John 1, 1 through 4, we can see it talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. So, in other words, uh, it's funny because I, I just heard a, a sermon that mentioned the poll number that I think 43% of so-called evangelical Christians believe that, that Jesus wasn't God. Yeah. And, uh, and I think actually it might have even been another poll some, somewhere along the lines of 60% or maybe 55% that thought Jesus was a created being. So this is bad, but it's very clear that he wasn't. He is God, the second person in the Trinity, and he came forth from the Father, not because the Father made him, but because he came from heaven where he was ruling and reigning with the Father. And he came into the world, and now... He's leaving the world and going to the Father. Now, he, didn't t he told them before three times that he was going to have to die and be tortured. They didn't really uh, understand, and right now he's not going there. So he's not telling them everything, but he's telling them the very basics. So it's getting less cryptic, if you will. His disciples said, see, you are speaking plainly, and are not using any figure of speech. So now they at least understand that, you know, he came from the Father and came into the world. Now he did. He was incarnated, right? He was born into the world because he came as a baby. But that meant he took on flesh, not that he was created. And now he's leaving the world and going to the Father. Now remember, they're still thinking about him restoring Israel. So it's not like he's not like they're saying, "Oh well, um, Jesus is going to be killed," and and we're all going to think that it's over. That he was talking about that, but they didn't get it. They wouldn't get it until it happened, until after the resurrection. So then, it says now. We know that you know all things. So it's another way of saying, now we know that you're God. You are that, that omniscient, all know, in other words, all-knowing God. And that you have no need for anyone to question you. That is why we believe that you came forth from God. So that is a wonderful statement of faith. Remember, Judas is not here. These are the 11 believing disciples. And they have demonstrated their faith. Now, that doesn't mean that their faith was strong, but they did have faith. What I found interesting, because Jesus replied to them and said, do you now believe that uh, I saw in commentary and a sermon that in the Greek, it could go either way. It could be a, a statement or a question. And I remember I grew up on the New International Version, the, I guess the 1973 version to, to date myself because I was growing up in the 80s. And it said, you believe at last, exclamation point. And here it says, do you now believe? What was interesting is I looked at quite a few different versions through Bible Gateway just to see what, what they all had. I didn't look at all of them. But 
I noticed that the newer versions tended to go in the form of a question. Uh, and even the older versions had a question, but, but a couple of the older versions, like for example, the Wycliffe Bible, that actually says, I want to say, ye now believe, I think is what it says exactly. And I didn't find any others on all the ones that I, that I looked at um, in English. Then I thought, well, you know what? I'll, I'll look in Spanish just to see if anything's different. I'm trying to remember if I saw any of them where the question, I think they were all question marks. I thought, okay, I'll look at French. I know enough French to be dangerous. So I saw the Louis Sagan Bible, which I guess is the more literal French Bible, more like the NASB or the ESV. And that one actually had it as a statement. But the Louis, but the Sagan 21, all of a sudden has it as a question. So it seems like everyone's kind of leaning toward that way. Yet what I'm hearing is that Jesus is basically saying that they do believe to some degree. But their faith is going to be tested and they're going to fail at that moment. It says, behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So all of a sudden he's letting them know that they're going to scatter, right? Peter's like, I'll die for you. Jesus has already told them he'll deny him three times. That doesn't mean that Peter is believing him yet. And who knows what the others were, were thinking at this point. I think, yeah, actually, I think they all said the same thing. <laughs> Although it doesn't show them how they, how they each said it. Yeah, I'll be there. We're all going to be there. We're going to stand strong. Well, they didn't. But notice, notice, he says that they're going to be scattered. They're all going to go home. They're going to leave them alone. And yet the father is going to be with Jesus in fact, I saw a commentary that where Charles Spurgeon was reminded of Abraham and Isaac when Abraham was going up to sacrifice Isaac and how they went together. So I'll read Genesis 22, 3 to 6. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split wood, notice wood, for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, hmm, third day, you know, I think crucifixion, resurrection, uh, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, Jesus carrying the cross. And he took it in his hand, in his hand, the fire and the knife. Remember God's wrath going, having to punish Jesus for our sins. So the two of them walked on together. And that's what reminded Charles Spurgeon that he could see the father and the son walking together as Jesus was going to the cross. Remember that even though God treated him as an unbeliever, as we should have been treated on that cross, what Jesus was doing was the holiest thing that he could do. Remember in, remember in the sacrificial system, 
You had to make the sacrifice a certain way. And if you did it that way, it would be called the pleasing aroma to God. But it had to be done just right. Well, this is the sacrifice of Jesus. The most pleasing aroma of all. And Jesus, the perfect unblemished lamb. The perfect sacrifice. And that's why the Jews needed to make sure that they did things the way God wanted them to. Because... The sacrifice represented his son and he was not going to tolerate them misrepresenting his son. That's what Moses did. He struck the rock twice. He should have spoken to it. And the rock was Christ. According to 1 Corinthians 10. And he misrepresented God and ultimately his son. And he was barred from the promised land. But yes, God was with Jesus the entire time. So, even though Jesus was alone, he wasn't alone. But the next part, and this is why it's so important. When you learn a Bible verse, is it good to memorize scripture? Absolutely. But so often, we can get duped in the memorizing scripture uh, just a verse over here. Oh, that's a nice verse. I like that one. I'm going to make it my life verse. Make it your life verse, perhaps, although <laughs> certainly if, if you go through long enough, you'll see that I needed these other verses too, and my life verse changes all the time. But the point is, the point is that we need to know within the context because it's so much richer than if we just take one verse. So here's verse 33. These things I have spoken to, to you so that in me you may have peace. What has he been speaking to them? I'm going away. Oh, you will have the Holy Spirit. Promise you that. You're going to be hated by the world. You're going to be even killed. Look at the first part of John 16. And they're going to think they're offering a wonderful service to God for killing you. And guess what? Your faith, you believe, but you know what? It's weak and it's not going to stand. Yeah, you're going to leave me all alone. And I'm letting you know all these things so that you will know in earlier in 16 that I knew this would happen, basically. Oh, that you we know that I told you of them. So in other words, wow, this was not a surprise to Jesus. It was not a surprise to Jesus that these 11 believing disciples we're going to leave him all alone. Well, John would be, would be at the cross. Peter would deny him three times. And the other nine, we don't even know. It is. They just up and left. Jesus knew all that. And yet, he offers them his peace. And notice that every time we so often use uh, verses like, do not let your heart be troubled. And we talk about, and that's in John 14, 1, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. But in what context? I've said it before. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. After he tells Peter, he's going to deny him three times. You think the disciples might have been a little bit troubled at that point? And he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Like the same idea as be still and know that I am God. That sort of command. And then Jesus is telling them, he's leaving his peace with them because he's going away. And now he's told them all the stuff that's going to happen to the disciples, even their failure. And he says, 
these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. So, in other words, their failure, you know, Jesus was going to pay for their failure in a few hours, just like he's paid for ours. You know, praise God that, and it's probably, I think about, well, no, this was Paul when he says that we're, we're faithless, I believe it's in Timothy, he will remain faithful. So know that when we sin, it doesn't stop God's grace. That does not mean, oh, habitual sin is okay. You can live how you want. No. In fact, if you are truly born again, you want to do everything other than live how you want. You want to live as God wants you to live. But in our human frailty, we fail. In fact, last night, Ginny and I were, were reading the Bible at night. We usually do. And we were reading about, in Joshua and Judges, it's a um, chronological Bible. And it talks about um, where the tribes didn't fully conquer the, well, the tribes of Israel did not fully conquer the Canaanites and they should have, but they didn't. They got complacent. They stopped. And it's interesting because that Bible has some headings on it right before you read the excerpt because sometimes like it even took us to Joshua and to Judges and, and back And it would say, the failure of each tribe, the failure of Judah, the failure of Benjamin, the failure of Naphtali, the failure of Issachar, and you name it. And I thought, wow, what a a microcosm for for the word of God and the hope in Christ. We are, in and of ourselves, failures. But God has overcome. He has overcome. Man's failure, God's triumph. We triumph in him if we put our faith in him. And so, so he offered them peace despite their betrayal, despite, well, not their betrayal, despite their denial, despite their cowardice. He offered them peace. And he tells them in this world, you have tribulation. Some versions say trouble, but I think tribulation is more. You know, trouble could be like, oh, I got a flat tire. Tribulation is more like, um, like I don't, maybe I don't know what I'm going to do for my next meal. And that's not even compared to, oh, they might kill me if they find out I'm a Christian. But take courage. I have overcome the world. And that's why we sang that song, Overcome. And so all this Even in the midst of their failure, Jesus is faithful. And so do not let, do not let the devil say, oh, uh, he's done with you. Nope. If you're in him, he's working on you. And he is overcome and in him we, we will overcome as well. And so the other part is how can we get that peace in our lives? Just quickly, anxiety is, um, well, the way I define anxiety is the absence 
of safety. You know, anxiety doesn't happen in a vacuum. If we feel anxious, it's because we don't feel safe either in our environment or with what might happen in the future, whether it be with people or circumstances that we cannot control. And so, how to have, how to be able to take in the peace? Remember that Jesus has overcome the world. Can you see yourself as safe in his arms? The more you do that, safe in his arms, regardless of whatever might happen, we know what our eternity is going to be like. Safe might, it might require your life. Okay, it might. So I'm not saying, oh, well, you're going to be just fine here on earth. It might require your life. But your eternity is sure. And so see yourself safe in his arms. As Deuteronomy says, the everlasting arms of God. So. All right. So we're going to receive communion. Um, please, um, please remember that you get to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus. So partake only if you can say, yes, I am in Christ. Because it's a very serious and very yet very yet very joyful, a very serious time where we remember the suffering of Christ and his resurrection. All right, so um, <laughs> as the communion still being passed. Let's just uh, put our minds on the Lord and just reflect on his wonderful sacrifice for us. Just think about, you can even think about our failures and his grace. How he is faithful and forgives us of our sin. And we and we praise them for it. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would would speak to our hearts. We, we thank you for, for your love, for your gentleness, for your, for your conviction, for everything that you've given us. You gave us all of you. And we just pray that that would compel us to give you all of us. Forgive us, Lord, for when we fail. I know I do. I know that I can't sit here and say that, that I'm 100% uh, focused on you. I need you. We need you. Just pray that you would, you would continue to, to draw us near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. His body was broken 
so that we could have new bodies and be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper with him. Let's praise him as we take the bread. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. He offers us his cup. He offers us fellowship. And he died for you. So we praise him and we, we thank him as we take the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your for your love. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that they are yes and amen. And so we pray that we will live with an eternal mindset each and every day. Thank you for being so good to us. And may we always remember that you have overcome in Jesus' name, amen.